Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to welcome you today to this lecture at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, it really gives me very great pleasure to welcome um, and introduce Jane Morris, who will talk on eating disorders in Scotland, how will we manage? Uh, Dr. Jane Morris is consultant psychiatrist at the Eden Unit, Royal Cornhill Hospital, Aberdeen, and lead clinician of the North of Scotland Managed Clinical Network for Eating Disorders, which covers Grampian, Tayside, and Highland Health Boards. She modestly claims to be a late starter in the specialism of eating disorders, <clears throat> and indeed she only turned to medicine after achieving a first-class honours degree in English literature from Newnham College, Cambridge, in 1971. Undeterred by the fact that she did not have any of the requisite A-levels to launch her new career, she very quickly got them, um, speedily achieved the entry requirements, and was subsequently awarded a medical degree with distinction from her alma mater. Now, Jane's hybrid background makes her a particularly appropriate speaker for this society that describes itself as embracing both science and letters. And many of her former patients bear witness to the way in which the values of the two cultures illuminate her clinical practice. Her first choice of specialism was actually cardiovascular medicine, but yet another U-turn led her to psychiatry. She developed an interest in adolescent psychiatry, specifically in eating disorders, at the Cullen Centre in Edinburgh, and moved to Glasgow then to set up the Parry Jones Teenage Anorexia Service at Gartnaval <coughs> Hospital. Subsequently, she became a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Royal Edinburgh Hospital before moving to her present post in Aberdeen. Her success in three of Scotland's major cities is evidenced by the recognition awarded to her by their three ancient universities, in each of which she holds honorary fellowships. Jane also serves on EDSECT, the Eating Disorders Section Executive Committee of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and until recently was a designated medical practitioner with the Scottish Mental Health Commission. In addition to being a highly respected clinician, Dr. Morris is a pioneering researcher in the field of eating disorders, her interest being primarily, uh, but not exclusively, in eating disorders in men and boys, and in exploring genetic predisposition to the illness and its effects on families. It is not surprising, therefore, that Dr. Morris's commitment to her patients extend to supporting their carers. She has established carers groups in all the hospitals where she has practiced and has offered sterling support to many others. She has chaired and or lectured to every one of the annual carers conferences organized by the Scottish Eating Disorders Interest Group, or SEDIG, a unique association of professional therapists and carers, which until recently she also chaired. She is a tireless campaigner in the fight to raise awareness of eating disorders in the public consciousness, among health professionals, in schools, and in political forums. She is a founder and chair of EATS, Eating Disorders Education and Training, which is funded by NHS Education Scotland to provide training in this area for a range of health professionals. The success of this is evidenced by the imminent likelihood of EATS accreditation becoming mandatory for those treating eating disorder patients. Dr. Morris edited and co-wrote the ABC of Eating Disorders, a comprehensive primer for GPs, dietitians, psychiatrists, and community health teams who need to incorporate a sophisticated awareness of the field in their professional practice. She has also contributed the chapter on eating disorders to the Royal College of Psychiatrists online continuing professional development program. With the support of Dennis Robertson, MSP, she has taken the case for further resources to the Scottish Parliament and raised government awareness of this somewhat neglected illness on two or three occasions before cross-party committees on mental health. 
The Scottish Government, in fact, made a major contribution to the events in last year's Eating Disorders Awareness Week, which is a year ago next week. But in spite of all this professional work, Jane is by no means a dull girl. She enjoys, or very much enjoys, her position as president of the Roll Committee of Newnham College, of which she is also an associate. A position which, as far as I can see, entails the arduous task of chairing and hosting two rather sumptuous banquets um, per annum for her alumni. Fair enough. <laughs> After all, a woman must eat. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you, everybody, for coming here on a Tuesday evening. On April the 21st of 2012, I found myself standing like this, addressing a congregation at the High Kirk of St. Giles, not far from here. But that was a memorial service to honor people who had died from anorexia nervosa. And I found myself torn between two opposing tasks. Of course, we wanted to bring comfort and reassurance to the bereaved. But at the same time, I wanted to fill everyone there with the same outrage and indignation that I was feeling and still feel now. I hate the illness for destroying lives. And I'm also frustrated by our failure to at least employ to the full those strategies that we do have to save lives and to save quality of life. I said on that day that services in Scotland have improved death by death, and I'm afraid that does seem to be the case. But it has taken more than tragic deaths to bring about that change. It has taken the heroic energy of the bereaved. The late Arthur Crisp said that calling anorexia nervosa an eating disorder is like calling lung cancer a cough disorder. This is such a good metaphor. Yes, anorexia is a killer. It killed Caroline. It killed Fraser. It killed Avril. The metaphor takes us further. If you call lung cancer a cough disorder, you're focusing on just one symptom and on, not necessarily on the most deadly one. Problems with eating are just one manifestation of anorexia nervosa. For most modern patients, this is based on their obsessive terror of body fat. It comes from their compulsive need to take extreme control of their body in response to anxiety, threat, or feelings of insecurity. The desperate avoidance of fatness and the drive to actually lose fat results in a whole host of symptoms. And the list is growing all the time as our culture changes. You probably know that the word anorexia is Latin for loss of appetite, but that is a complete misnomer. The brain's appetite centers are actually working overtime to make the starving person think constantly about food. The sufferer fights back in all sorts of ways to deprive their body of nourishment in the midst of plenty. As a result, the brain experiences both war and famine. When brains experience trauma, they put out the same stress hormones, whether that trauma is war, famine, or abuse. The acute stress hormones are adrenaline and noradrenaline, but more chronically, the brain pumps out stress steroids, and the patient experiences hyperarousal, irritability, a sense of suspicion, hostility, and avoidance of other people. Now, one thing we probably all think when we hear that someone has lung cancer is that it was caused by smoking. We're wrong. Smoking does indeed cause many cough disorders, but only a few vulnerable smokers develop lung cancer. Plenty of people with lung cancer are non-smokers who suffer from mere bad luck. And as if it isn't bad luck enough to have lung cancer, those people are often also embarrassed by their diagnosis and afraid that other people blame them for it. 
Well, in the same way, it seems to be generally believed that anorexia is the result of too many fashion magazines and silly diets. And certainly such influences have increased the prevalence of anorexia in the world. But they're more important in the epidemic of other eating disorders, such as bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorders. Some unlucky people have suffered from anorexia throughout history. And Borders dietitian Perry Burgess tells us there's even an example in the Old Testament. St. Catherine of Siena saw her sister die in childbirth. She was then expected to marry the widower. Apparently, the late sister had often refused to eat if her husband was unkind. Catherine now used the same tactics. She refused food until she was allowed to become a nun. But she continued to fast, and she now uh, used a straw to induce vomiting, too. She said she was doing it as a religious practice. Interestingly, her spiritual advisors disagreed and commanded her to eat, but she refused. And she ultimately died of her condition in her early 30s. Mary, Queen of Scots, may have been another early sufferer during her teenage years in the French court. She did survive anorexia, although she didn't survive Elizabeth of England. It was an Englishman, Richard Morton, who provided the first medical description of what we now call anorexia. In 1689, he published an account in Latin of two cases of deliberate self-starvation. The teenage daughter of a Mr. Dukes and the teenage son of the Reverend Steele. Sadly, the girl died of her illness. But the boy was advised to give up his studies, leave town, and drink milk. And we now know that milk provides renourishment without the danger of refeeding syndrome. We believe that he survived. Moving now to 18th century Scotland, let me show you the view from my Aberdeen flat where I sit at the window eating my morning porridge. The statue outside Aberdeen Grammar School across the road is of the most famous old boy of the school, the poet Lord Byron. We hear that he was mad, bad and dangerous to know, but we don't know how far his personality may have been damaged by the effects of his well-documented obsession with losing weight. When he went out to dinner, he would demand water and plain biscuits, and he would refuse to eat at all if they were not provided. He undertook obsessive exercise regimes too, and he wrote boastfully to his friends about his increasing thinness. He died in his early 30s. We don't know whether his death from a fever was related in any way to his eating disorder. The physicians William Gull in England and Charles Le Seg in France described anorexia nervosa in the late 19th century, so that for the first part of the 20th century, eating disorders were recognized as medical conditions, but more as curios than as mainstream illnesses, and many sufferers have been diagnosed only in retrospect. The French philosopher and mystic Simone Weil almost certainly suffered from anorexia. Throughout the Second War, her fallback response of solidarity with suffering people was to eat even less than they were able to. And whilst many people adored her, others commented that she was odd and humorless. These are common characteristics of starved, anxious brains. She died, as you see, in her early 30s. On this side of the channel, my grandparents' generation was at war. People were more focused on surviving on rationed food, keeping chickens in the backyard and digging their allotments, than on diagnosing anorexia in their children. At the age of 12, my father was sent away from his family into the countryside, for the sake of his health and survival. There was more food than at home in the city, and he was released from the stresses of a very academic school. 
but as a lifelong vegetarian, he was unable to eat the plentiful meat. And for some reason, he didn't make up for that with the home baking and cheese and other dairy products that he loved. He began wasting away with a mysterious, unexplained illness until my grandmother brought him back to the bomb shelters of the city where he recovered and flourished. However, he was still known for giving away his ration tickets to others. And some decades later, several members of his children's generation were recognized as suffering from what you now formally label as eating disorders. Not long after the war, in coronation year in 1953, an Aberdeen teenager was diagnosed as suffering from anorexia nervosa. She received treatment at three of the city's hospitals, both psychiatric and medical, and 60 years later, my colleague Linda Keenan found her medical records in a filing cabinet in the managed clinical network office. The history of Miss C is clearly documented in handwritten notes and pink carbon copies of typed letters. I followed the story with bated breath as if it was a sort of professional, who do you think you are? Miss C was the younger of two orphaned siblings. She was always sensitive. She had been traumatized by the sight of her dead mother's body. She and her sister went to live with their maternal aunt in a granite house in Ashley Road. And here it is on Street View. I was able to walk past it, and I could imagine the family driving to hospital in the mm -hmm. uncle's Rover 75 saloon car. I was fascinated to find that Miss C was treated with old-fashioned versions of many of the treatments that we still use today. Perhaps the main difference is that these days we would try to understand what Miss C was thinking and feeling emotionally, rather than focusing only on trying to outwit her anorexic behaviours to make her gain weight. <clears throat> Another difference is that 60 years on, we have some specialist eating disorders services in Scotland. However, Miss C had become so physically ill that she had to be admitted to the Royal Infirmary. And this is often the case for our patients today. Sadly, it was there that Miss C died, throwing herself out of a fourth floor window. Professor Miller wrote that no one imagined that she would have the strength even to get out of bed, and no one suspected that she was suicidal. It emerged that the Professor Miller concerned in this tragic case was the father of Dr. Harry Miller, Aberdeen's renowned first eating disorders consultant. Harry set up the first specialist eating disorders outpatient clinic in the north of the country. He campaigned tirelessly to bring about the North of Scotland managed clinical network, and he pioneered the use of telemedicine. He was also the force behind the Eden Unit, Scotland's first NHS eating disorders inpatient unit, which opened in May of 2009. Even earlier, the first specialist eating disorder service in Edinburgh was Chris Freeman's Cullen Centre. Until the 80s, patients with severe anorexia were admitted to general wards or to units with a psychodynamic ethos, where they were nursed alongside those with other diagnoses. The Cullen Centre, like the Aberdeen service, pioneered the use of the new cognitive behavioural therapy. These were remarkable times in the world of eating disorders. In 1979, Beck had published his textbook of cognitive behavioral therapy, and clinicians from the Cullen Center went on pilgrimage to Philadelphia to train with him. In the same year, Professor Gerald Russell published his classic paper describing a case series of a new eating disorder. He called it bulimia nervosa, an ominous variant of anorexia nervosa. Serendipitously, it was found that the new therapy was an astonishingly good fit for the new disorder. And Professor Chris Fairburn went on to base his career on meticulously developing and researching the application of CBT to the eating disorders. <clears throat> 
Incidentally, whilst Russell has spent his heyday in London and Fairburn his in Oxford, Scotland may claim them too. Russell is an alumnus of George Watson's College and Fairburn undertook medical training in both Edinburgh and St Andrews. The essence of the cognitive behavioural approach is encapsulated in this sort of diagram, sometimes known as the hot cross bun. It allows us to consider four important dimensions of our experience, all of which interact, as you see, in complicated circles and even tangles. These are our feelings, thoughts, behaviours and physical states. For clinicians today, just like those nursing Miss C in 1953, the obvious problem is the anorexic behaviours which occur when we encourage the sufferer to eat. But our empathic nurses also feel and consider a patient's emotions too, the fear and the fury that are generated by the illness. And in one-to-one -one sessions outside mealtimes, our key nurses work to elicit the automatic thoughts and beliefs that drive those feelings. These are a mixture on one hand of anorexic obsessions and on the other misinterpretations of bodily feelings. And we can trace some of these back to their physiological origins in terms of hypoglycemic symptoms and the consequences of stress hormones. So that without even embarking on a formal course of therapy, our team uses the CBT formulation to guide an integrated approach to supporting our patients. The nurses adopt a firm but soothing approach at the table, refusing to be drawn into fights, chatting calmly or switching on gentle music. The occupation and physiotherapists teach relaxation techniques. And our dietitians prescribe those foods which best maintain stable blood sugar levels and build up glycogen stores in the liver. Our doctors prescribe suitable medications to dampen down ruminations and panic. Using CBT approaches, the pioneering new specialist outpatient services soon built up considerable reputations and considerable waiting lists too. One problem was that clinicians felt obliged to prioritise low weight patients at the expense of long waits for those of a more normal weight. And yet it was the non-urgent patients who responded best to the outpatient therapies. This continues to be the case today. In fact, as the century came to an end, another highly effective treatment for bulimia and binge eating disorder reached Scotland from North America. This was IPT, the Interpersonal Therapy of Clareman and Weissman. IPT Scotland was set up under the chair of Lorna Champion, and soon Scotland could boast more IPT therapists per head of population than any other country. IPT recognises that our patients are often highly sensitive to the interpersonal stresses of bereavement, conflict or transition. Now, it's impossible to completely avoid such life stresses, so this therapy helps people to develop skills for managing interpersonal interactions, as well as skills for tolerating uncomfortable emotions. Now, unfortunately, whilst more anorexic patients were now recovering, many still did not, and some died. In my very first month as a trainee working at the Cullen Centre in the 90s, there were two deaths. Both were young women who had been repeatedly referred to medical hospitals, but they were tested there for medical causes of their physical symptoms, such as chest pain, but then discharged if it was found that they hadn't suffered from particular common diagnoses, such as heart attacks or pulmonary emboli. After these tragedies, the Cullen Centre determinedly headhunted a sympathetic physician, the diabetologist James Walker, and we established a mutually supportive professional relationship which undoubtedly saved lives. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, Harry Miller and NHS Grampian enlisted support from Alastair McKinley, a GI physician with a specialist interest in nutrition and with the charisma to imbue his whole department with enthusiasm for the medical management of anorexic patients. Child and adolescent services had always managed eating disorders. Indeed, anorexia nervosa is the commonest diagnosis in adolescent wards. There were also attempts to deliver intensive treatments without bringing children into hospital. Edinburgh had a day programme where patients could attend for therapy, for meals, and even study in the YPU school but sleep at home. In Glasgow, the Parry Jones service provided a small group-based service for day patients with anorexia and family groups for their parents in the evening. For adults, the Lothian Anorexia Nervosa Intensive Treatment Team, ANET, was set up to provide intensive outreach to patients in their homes. And Forth Valley and Fife have also adopted the ANET model. More recently, Glasgow Adult Services have pioneered a, a model of specialist eating disorder teams which provide expert consultation to clinicians rather than direct care to patients. But it became increasingly clear that it was not after all possible to provide an adequate range of services for people with severe eating disorders without both a safety net of medical support from a general hospital and also a specialist psychiatric inpatient unit. The NHS sent low-weight patients to private hospitals, such as Huntercombe and the Priory, but still failed to meet demand and need. Meanwhile, clinicians, family carers, and some recovered sufferers banded together to form the charity SEDIG, the Scottish Eating Disorders Interest Group, which, as Jan said, is unique for involving lay and professional members on an equal footing and for hosting one-day conferences three or four times every year on a shoestring budget. Its functions have included education, networking and political campaigning too. The development of eating disorder services in Scotland in the first decade of this century is partly Lindsay's legacy. Lindsay, whose death at the age of only 20 in 2004 prompted an ombudsman's inquiry. The ombudsman found that Lindsay had been transferred between as many as nine different hospitals at the end of her life. And the biggest lesson from this was one embodied in an editorial in the British Journal of Psychiatry by Professors Schmidt and Treasure. They called the principle, Mind the Gap. Of course, eating disorders become worse in gaps in treatment when there is no one to fight against them. But what's more, eating disorders are a person's way to cope when there is change and insecurity, and so that even more treatment rather than less is needed to help people cope with change and transition. The body called Quality Improvement Scotland, or QIS, appointed the two leading eating disorders clinicians in Scotland, Drs Miller and Freeman, as co-chairs of a committee to draw up recommendations for the management of eating disorders. And these were published in 2006, incorporating the English NICE guidelines of 2004 with modifications and expansions specific to Scotland. Chris Freeman then presented these recommendations at Harry Miller's new Aberdeen Eating Disorders Conference, which has since become a regular national event. The same group of clinicians then worked to set up a training curriculum and accreditation in eating disorders as a benchmark for competence in the specialty and as a way to maintain quality. This is EATS, which stands for Eating Disorders Education and Training Scotland. It is unique in the world, and since its launch, dozens of clinicians in Scotland across the gamut of involved professions and working across the whole age range have been accredited or re-accredited. And ultimately, both Harry and Chris succeeded in setting up specialist NHS inpatient units in the north and southeast 
so that adults with eating disorders need not be sent too far away from home and could remain as far as possible within NHS specialist networks. But you'll be asking yourselves by now, why have we been so slow to invest in the well-being and indeed the survival of some of the brightest and best of the young people of Scotland? After all, the care of people with a severe anorexia nervosa is hardly rocket science, is it? Well, the father of one of my patients was a rocket scientist, and he ensured me that anorexia is the harder challenge. The NICE guideline is now 11 years old, Quiz 9 years old, and whilst we're working hard to update them both, the new versions won't be published until 2017, and even then there will only be a certain amount of new evidence to add to the recommended treatments. This is particularly true for anorexia. There has been only one treatment so far which meets stringent evidence criteria for anorexia. And that treatment is the family-based treatment called FBT. It developed from work at the Maudsley Hospital in the 1990s and was then manualized and tested out by Professor James Locke in California and Danny Lagrange in Chicago. I'm proud to say that Scotland has led Europe in embracing delivery of this treatment. Colleagues in Greater Glasgow and Clyde were the first to be trained, followed by Lothian, and then only last year we brought James Locke to the north of Scotland to train both child and adult clinicians. And as you see here, we dropped him off in the Scottish Parliament on the way so that MSPs could discuss his work. On the right of this picture, and a little way back in the audience, is Dr. Charlotte Oakley from Glasgow, whose research has already demonstrated improved outcomes for FBT in comparison with previous treatments, and with greater cost effectiveness too. Hospital admissions are reduced or in some cases not needed at all with this treatment. In the north, we're putting together a case series showing how the model can be effectively adapted for adult patients too, provided that they live at least temporarily with a parent, partner or other carer. FBT involves the patient and family meeting together for an hour at a time on a regular basis with a therapist. Initially, they're encouraged to get in touch with their realistic fears about the illness rather than avoiding confrontation for the sake of a quiet life. They're encouraged to see anorexia as a separate phenomenon from the personality of the patient. It's a cruel illness, not a piece of naughtiness, not a lifestyle choice, and it can be deadly. The therapist then teaches the family skills very similar to those used by nurses on an inpatient unit to support the patient to eat healthily, to resist purging and over-exercising, and to tolerate weight restoration. The family even brings a picnic into the therapist's office so that they can be coached in a hands-on way. It's a sort of master class on how to refeed someone with anorexia. But we must acknowledge that the excellent evidence base for FBT so far only applies to teenagers, particularly those with a short duration of illness. For adults with anorexia, there is very little hard evidence to guide us. Therapies such as CBT, DBT and IPT have been developed to address anorexia as well as bulimia, but even their leading proponents acknowledge that they're less effective the lower the patient's weight. And as a clinician caring for adults with very low body weight and with disabling anorexic obsessions, this worries me. So I'll focus now on some of the newer, most promising approaches to very severe anorexia. Some involve direct treatments, but some involve measuring and monitoring, and we mustn't forget preventative approaches too. One approach is such a simple matter that we all wonder why it hasn't been used before, or at least we wonder that until we try it. Chris Freeman talked throughout his career about the need of some sort of register of anorexia, 
Harry Miller, ahead of his time, set up an electronic patient record at the Grampian Eating Disorders Service, but we still have no overview of anorexia across the country as a whole. We have to rely on incidence and prevalence rates from other countries, and we have only poor measures of what works and what doesn't. Numbers of patients in each specialist service are relatively small, so we need to access data from across the whole country to get statistically meaningful assessments. We need to know the scale of the problem so that we can plan adequate services. Full recoveries can take years or even decades, so we need to track outcomes over long periods of time, and obviously we must examine how anorexia causes or contributes to the deaths of sufferers. We did recently try to examine mortality figures for anorexia over the past 10 years, but we were dumbfounded to find that some death, death certificates failed to mention anorexia at all in people we knew had suffered at the time of their death, whilst others cited anorexia in folk in their 80s and 90s who may have stopped eating at the end of their life but had not suffered from anorexia nervosa as a psychiatrist would define it. A national record would allow us to conduct prospective studies. We could follow up all those diagnosed with the condition to see how they fare through life and what the impact would be of the different treatments we could offer. Happily, we're making some preliminary headway at last. Dr. Kirsty License, with Steve Kendrick and colleagues at the Excellent Information Services Division of the NHS Scotland, are working with us to set up an anorexia nervosa linked electronic database. Technology has given us pro ana websites. It allows eating disorders to spread like a virus across Facebook. But technology can also be made to help in the fight against eating disorders. In particular, high quality, high security video conferencing already helps us to deliver assessment, therapy, and also supervision and training to remote and rural communities. It helps deliver services to the highlands and islands and for frail anorexic patients, it can save risky long-distance travel to winter appointments. Obviously, anorexia is physically dangerous. We know from bitter experience that simply delivering medical treatment as you would to a person without anorexia is not enough. Anorexic fears oblige people to sabotage treatments that may bring about weight gain. And as we saw, this was what killed Miss C in 1953. She was not suicidal, but she was prepared to die rather than to gain weight. The Royal College of Psychiatrists has developed guidelines called marzipan and junior marzipan. Marzipan is an attractive acronym standing for the management of really seriously ill patients with anorexia nervosa. And it reminds mental health professionals of the medical risks and reminds physicians of the behavioral risks of the illness. It charts ways to stabilize and re-nourish those who are in extremis without causing deaths from refeeding syndrome. And it's not just a tick box. It's actually a good way to insist that our health board's budget to provide the specific nursing and medical interventions and perhaps above all, it helps us to mind that gap, the gap between physical and mental health services on this occasion. But generally, physical recovery alone doesn't guarantee psychological recovery. My patients worry that all I care about is feeding them up so that they don't look emaciated anymore, and at that point I stop caring. Yet it's at that point that they are at their most vulnerable and most desperately need help and concern. For some young teenagers, refeeding the brain by itself can be enough to nudge them back onto their developmental path, and they can pick up where they left off and learn how to cope without starving. But people who have been anorexic for years and decades know only one way to cope with life, 
they have become addicted to the chemicals of body breakdown. The starved brain is blinkered and rigid in its thinking, and anxiety and stress also throw us back on rigid, automatic ways of behaving. So some of the newer treatments for anorexia look for ways to free up that stiffness and ease the paralyzing anxiety. Our time is limited this evening, so I'll focus now on physical rather than psychological therapies. I trained as a psychotherapist, so this may seem a strange choice. But the thing is, as a therapist, I find myself demanding more and more courage and hard work from patients who are terrified and exhausted. One patient, Rebecca, has begged me to tell you tonight that the tough love that our therapies offer is simply far too tough. So it seems only compassionate to look for interventions that won't demand even more effort, but might provide a little help along the way. So let's just try an experiment. Um, I've asked Francis to come up and play the part of my patient. And on each side, I'm going to ask Alice and Sarah to represent anorexia. So when I ring my bell, I would like each of you to shout your anorexic script into the ear of the patient. But meanwhile, Francis, your task is to think about your plans for the rest of the year and what you're going to do in detail to bring those about. So you start planning, Francis. You're disgusting. You're gross and fat and greedy. Just look at you. No one will ever love you. That's 65 calories, plus 23 calories makes 88. Add it to the 15 calorie grape makes 103, or is it 107? No, no, best say 110 to be safe. You're incompetent and useless and lazy. No one will ever employ you. You don't deserve to even enjoy life. How many star jumps do you need to do before bed tonight to get rid of those 110 calories? Just look at you. That woman over there, she's looking at you. She's thinking how fat you are. Now she's looking away. She can't even bear the sight of you. Perhaps you should take an overdose to avoid having to eat dinner. Francis, how did you get on with your planning? <laughs> Let's try it a second time, but this time Ladies, could you please murmur the words rather than shout them? And could you perhaps turn your backs on Francis? You're disgusting. You're gross and fat and greedy. Just look at you. No one will ever love you. That's 65 calories. Plus 23 calories makes 88. Add to the 15 calorie weight makes 103. What's 107? No, best say 110 to be safe. You're incompetent and useless and lazy. No one will ever employ you. You don't deserve to enjoy life. How many star jumps do you need to do before bed tonight to get rid of those 110 calories? Just look at you. That woman's looking at you. She's thinking how fat you are. Now she's looking away. She can't bear the sight of you. Francis, was it any easier that time? Well, thank you very much indeed, and I should perhaps just reassure people that we are going to take Francis out to dinner and give her therapy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. So I think we agree it's not so overwhelmingly difficult when you can hush the horrible nagging ruminations just a beat. Of course, one way to do that is to give in and do exactly what anorexia says. But another way might be to take small doses of the drug olanzapine. For many years, we've tried prescribing antidepressants and other anti-anxiety medications for people with low-weight anorexia. They didn't really seem to work, and in fact, high-dose antidepressants can be risky for people with starved heart muscle. Meanwhile, the benzodiazepines are not only habit-forming, but they can prevent the laying down of memories, and we need to lay down memories in order to learn. But olanzapine 
seems to be remarkably safe, even for young, low-weight children. It has been used widely in higher doses in the treatment of psychotic disorders, but for anorexia we use much smaller doses. The aim is not to cause weight gain, we need food for that. Nor are we trying to sedate people. The sedative effect wears off when the brain has adjusted. We prescribe olanzapine for a specific effect on the brain's dopaminergic pathways. These are the brain areas that mediate our sense of fulfillment and empowerment. And it's no coincidence that these are the pathways affected by cocaine. Some Dutch eating disorders colleagues have worked with Aberdeen's Rowett Institute to create an animal model of anorexia. You can't give rats body image concerns, but certain genetic strains of rodent can be trained to lose weight compulsively by over-exercising. This is how it works. The animal is only fed when it's done a certain amount of exercise on its wheel. The researchers then gradually increase the amount of exercise and decrease the amount of feed provided until eventually feeding stops altogether. This is where the healthy rat would go on strike. But the genetically vulnerable animal actually goes on exercising even more. And spookily, if the experimenter does now offer some feed, the animal rejects it and prefers to run itself to death. So how do they save the rat? One way is to physically restrain the animal and tube feed it. Or they have found you can make surgical lesions in the dopaminergic pathways of the brain. Or more elegantly and reversibly, you can prescribe small doses of olanzapine. And this is especially interesting because we're seeing more and more of the compulsive exercise type of anorexia, particularly in male patients. In the past, anorexia with compulsive exercise had a bad outlook. But now that we're working with physiotherapists and prescribing olanzapine, we're trying to improve that prognosis. And we know that prescribing olanzapine has psychological benefits too. My patients tell me that often the drug is crucial in helping them to quieten down those repetitive ruminations, which nag away at them, keeping them awake at night and stressed by day. It clears their head, allowing them to be the person they were meant to be rather than the tortured slave of starvation. My team would be reluctant these days to enrol patients in a randomized controlled trial of olanzapine for fear that our patients might get placebo. But luckily there are studies, including the first randomized control um, of olanzapine versus placebo, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry by Bisada in 2008. Another substance that's attracted a lot of attention is the hormone oxytocin, and I expect you've heard of it. It's become the modern equivalent of the encounter groups and rebirthing experiences of the hippie era. It's one of those things you can sniff and snort, and the theory is that the nose has a hotline to the brain, so that you're filled with the equivalent of a new mother's love for her baby, or the afterglow of orgasm. In fact, we can stimulate a bit of oxytocin let down in you right now by showing this picture. There's a growing body of literature that suggests that inhaled oxytocin helps in a number of conditions. Above all, it was found helpful in autistic spectrum disorders, where people suffer from high anxiety levels, rigid thinking, and difficulties with emotional and interpersonal skills. Professor um, Chris Gilberg of the University of Glasgow has suggested there's considerable overlap between autistic and anorexic symptoms. So perhaps it's no surprise that oxytocin has been reported beneficial in both conditions. However, Professor Gareth Leng has doubts. Gareth is an internationally respected physiologist from the University of Edinburgh, and I encourage you to access his university webpage and view his YouTube presentations. He explains rather irreverently that oxytocin is a large peptide molecule which cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, not even through the nostril. But he acknowledges that sniffing the hormone does result in shed loads of oxytocin in the blood supply below the neck. 
It has effects on the heart rate and the blood pressure and also on the genital tract. Now, if we're treating a condition as disabling as anorexia, does it really matter if the results come from parts of the body um, other than uh, the way we experience those parts? After all, some people would take beta blockers because when they slow down our heart rate, our brain interprets that as a reduction in anxiety. Actually, I think we do need to be alert to the possibility that oxytocin may be inflicting changes on parts of the body that we weren't looking out for. Obviously, that's especially worrying when the body concerned is starved and weakened. But in contrast, the next experimental treatments I'd like to discuss do directly target the brain, though we don't know exactly how. I'm talking about RTMS, repeated transcranial magnetic stimulation, and DBS, or deep brain stimulation. These have not yet been routinely used for anorexia nervosa in Scotland, but we're discussing them with Professor Keith Matthews in Dundee and with Professor Ulrika Schmidt at the Institute of Psychiatry, and DBS with the neurosurgeon Ludwig Zrinzo at University College. In 2016, we plan to offer Scottish patients the chance to join a multi-centre trial of deep brain stimulation. This is a technique involving an implanted device rather like a heart pacemaker. The stimulation can be switched on and off. And that also allows patients to be their own controls for purposes of research. So far, the most outstanding results have been achieved with patients with OCD. And the work came about when Ludwig started stimulating the brains of patients with resistant Parkinson's disease. We know that the part of the brain affected by OCD is coincidentally the same area, the basal ganglia. And as we've discussed, we can think of anorexia nervosa in terms of it being an obsessive compulsive weight losing disorder. My particular serious interest in this field is related to a piece of work we have been doing examining the plight of patients whose illness seems to be treatment resistant. At a recent network event in Perth, we discussed a draft guideline from the Faculty of Eating Disorders. It rules that when patients have been ill for many years, we must ensure that we've properly delivered both mainstream treatments, but also some of these promising novel treatments. And only then may we switch to support that is focused on immediate quality of life, rather than continuing to inflict difficult intrusive treatments that are aimed at cure. But before we finish tonight, I'd just like us to consider the issue of prevention. People are already boldly going into schools to raise awareness of eating disorders with the assumption that this will be helpful and apparently without concern that harm may be done. Yet we haven't got a very good record on preventative strategies so far in any field. You'll be painfully aware that Scotland is in the grip of an obesity epidemic. And since the start of this millennium, schools have offered many well-meaning educational interventions aimed at reducing obesity and improving the diet of our young people. During this period, obesity has increased. On the other hand, many of my patients' parents have said that such classes definitely triggered particular avoidance of high calorie or high fat food in their low weight children. And I can also remember studies from the 90s which showed that teaching teenagers about drug abuse kindled interest and curiosity for experimenting with drugs. Those grainy black and white posters actually glamorized addiction in the eyes of some young people. In the field of eating disorders, it's taken a while for preventative interventions to be manualized and monitored. And we now have research finally demonstrating that most packages studied are ineffective, with just a few interventions providing positive benefits at least in the short term. Some studies suggest we would do better to target particular high-risk groups rather than offering global one-size-fits-all programs. <coughs> 
And I have wondered whether we might actually learn from the healthy siblings of people with severe eating disorders. Gemma Whitney and Janet Treasure have demonstrated that the families of people with anorexia experience a higher burden of care and higher levels of personal depression and anxiety than even the carers of people with chronic schizophrenia. Siblings can be torn between their own concern for the sick child and sorrow that their own needs are overlooked while the sick child can take up so much of a family's energy. The sister of one patient of mine told me she was tempted to experiment with anorexia herself, partly to relieve her feelings, but also to get noticed. And of course, she too is probably genetically predisposed to be vulnerable. It astonishes me that even in the current climate of body image obsession, she nevertheless did not succumb to anorexia. I feel we could learn so much from these young people. So we have proposed a study to track healthy young girls from the age of 7 to 17 to see if we could discover what triggered eating disorders, and more importantly, what built resilience. Some of the girls would have a close relative with anorexia, so they would be at theoretically higher risk than those who don't have a family history of the disorder. Now, this idea attracted lots of interest from research groups south of the border, but they suggested that Scotland would be the ideal place to pilot the project. I should have remembered that they said the same thing about the poll tax. <laughs> Here is our hypothesis about the way anorexia develops in young people, and there's a lot of supportive evidence to back the idea that some people are genetically predisposed with the kind of sensitivity that can underlie anorexia. But even then, not all vulnerable individuals will succumb, so there are certainly triggering factors involved too. Now at the moment, most treatments are based on changing that balance between influences that go on to perpetuate the disorder and those which fight against its continuation. However, we have very little prospective work that examines how these things actually interact. So our pilot prospective study is called Girls Growing Up. It involves identifying hypothetical risk factors and antecedents in young girls who are still healthy, and then tracking them year by year to see either what makes the risk factors turn into full-blown disorder, or on the other hand, what helps the girl to stay healthy. Now, the conventional way to measure psychosocial risk factors is to carefully interview people or ask them to fill in various validated questionnaires. We do this, but it has its limits and it can get tedious. It would be far more useful if we could develop some simple, reliable screening test rather like screening tests or smears or blood tests that can pick up markers before any damage is done. Well, we considered brain scans, but even in the future, when there's such cheap technology that perhaps we can all do brain scan selfies, these will still be incredibly complex to interpret. And in seven to 17 year olds, there'll be a growing and developing brain, so a moving target and we often won't know whether we're looking at mere immaturity of function or a lasting abnormality. So we're not scanning our girls. We will plot growth charts of height and weight across the age range, which might show us how starvation develops, but it's more likely to show consequences rather than antecedents. Genetic samples, again, might be able to help us understand whether or not a child has inherited a gene variant that might increase her likelihood of developing anorexia. But research shows us that we're not looking at a single gene here, but for variable and subtle combinations of both genetic and epigenetic factors. We will be requesting mouth smears if our girls want to contribute to the genetic studies that are already going on. But our team is searching for a smarter marker. Such a marker will ideally tell us whether a child is at high enough risk to make it worthwhile to train their family in anti-anorexic tactics before the disorder takes hold. This might include regular growth monitoring, treating any emerging OCD symptoms, 
improving assertiveness and emotional regulation, and of course getting on top of any early signs of starvation before they become deep-rooted. We also suspect that people who are at high genetic risk for anorexia may need different kinds of preventative strategy from people who are not at genetically high risk. Perhaps these people succumb to eating disorders by different pathological pathways. So while we were looking for our possible SMART marker, we came across the work of Professor David Sinclair and Dr. Phil Benson from Aberdeen. They have analyzed the eye movements of patients with severe mental illness, and they collaborated with us to analyze the eye movements of a small series of my inpatients. The youngest member of the Girls Growing Up team is psychologist Leanne C., who wrote her thesis on eye movement patterns in people with anorexia. Leanne has found that, as you might expect, these patients tend to look at both food-related and body image-related material in preference to other parts of pictures. But what might surprise you more is that the actual style of looking is different too. For instance, Leanne tells us that patients tend to focus on fine details in pictures and to look over these repetitively rather than to scan broadly around the picture frame. They also move their eyes more slowly than normal and then when asked to follow moving dots they then have to use catch-up eye movements. We don't yet know whether these differences are present before the people develop a disorder or whether they are consequences. And in fact, we still have to discover whether eye movements are a signature characteristic throughout life, like fingerprints, or whether they change and develop as the brain grows and changes, like height or body shape, for instance. It's very difficult for us as clinicians to negotiate today's research bureaucracy. But we've met from, with great kindness and generosity from colleagues, from trainees, and above all, from Professor Helen Minnis of Glasgow University's Department of Child Psychiatry. At present, we're recruiting from the Greater Glasgow and Clyde area only. But once the pilot is complete, we'll be seeking to involve centres across Scotland and probably beyond. We're launching our website next month, so please do look out for it. And whether or not you live near Glasgow, if your family and friends are interested in being contacted in the future, please do send your contact details. Leave them or else email us. At this stage in my career, I'm fortunate enough now to hear from people who have finally recovered, often after many years of struggle against anorexia. Despite their former resistance, they express surprising gratitude towards all those who helped them towards their recovery, and they all contribute remarkably to our society. I'm still frustrated and sad that we don't help more sufferers, and that some still can't be saved. But new research brings new hope, and whilst we work towards ever more powerful treatments, we have to fall back on that old but powerful treatment, tough love. The hardest challenge is how to hold on to a healthy balance that is both tough enough and loving enough. So I'd like to thank all those who work with me, advise me, criticize me and care for me to find that balance. Many, many thanks to our patients and their families for the trust that they put in our teams and networks. And thank you all for joining me this evening. Thank you very much indeed, Jane. That was um, very interesting and um, very informative. Uh, I think there is time for some questions, should you so wish. And we have Una and Katrina there, <laughs> ready, uh, with the microphones. Um, if you would like to ask a question, could you please raise your hand? And uh, one of the um, young ladies will actually come and give you a microphone. Uh, once you receive the microphone, you hold it horizontally as a pop star in front of your 
like, like that. You know how pop stars hold of it. <laughs> like that. Um, and if you would like to give your name, please do. You don't have to, of course. Um, we are, remember, recording this, so it's, it's fine. Okay, uh, do we have any questions? The gentleman here, I think, is first in the third row. Thanks. Do we have any knowledge of whether patterns are similar throughout the world? I'm thinking of poorer developing countries. Do they have the same sort of pattern as we have here? Um, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, we do know that all over the world, anorexia nervosa exists. So not only throughout history, but throughout geography. Um, there are some people who um, cause themselves to lose weight. Uh, it's not always related to body image, though. In some societies, it does seem to have religious um, connotations. On the other hand, not all civilizations uh, seem to experience the more normal weight eating disorders, such as bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. And there's been a particularly interesting study in Fiji where they found that before the advent of television, there were very, very few eating disorders in Fiji. Um, after the advent of television, um, interestingly, eating disorders became rife, but at the same time, the average weight of Fijians increased. No, sorry, the lady, uh, no, sorry, it's a gentleman, and it's just up there, Katrina, thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you for a worrying talk. Um, has any work been done to see whether hypnos hypnosis helps? Thank you. Yes, um, there has been work using hypnosis, and not only direct hypnosis um, of a, a classical kind, um, but also some techniques that I feel have a lot in common with hypnosis, such as, for instance, EMDR. That's eye movement desensitization and um, reprogramming. Um, and yes, those do seem to be promising, but the uh, the research isn't so far statistically valid. We've got quite a lot of case series and quite a lot of uh, reports which are not controlled with placebo um, and not followed up for long enough um, to know whether it actually contributes towards recovery. But if, if you have an interest in doing such research, please do contact me. Uh, Katrina, just behind you, the gentleman at the end. Hello, Dr. Morris. How, are you able to describe the symptoms you would expect to see from someone you would say has recovered from anorexia? What should we, in fact, be looking for? Um, well, symptoms of health, symptoms of recovery. Um, I think, by definition, uh, somebody who has recovered from anorexia nervosa shouldn't actually be showing any symptoms of the disorder. Uh, although they may, of course, still be showing symptoms of the underlying sensitivity. And I do, in fact, find that quite a lot of my patients continue to have to wrestle uh, with anxiety disorders, and particularly some of the other obsessional disorders. Uh, but uh, an aged Scandinavian professor, Sten Theander, has actually written a list of the criteria for recovery. And if you can regard recovery as a condition that has symptoms, it includes the ability to tolerate uh, normal weight, the ability to eat socially in a normal way, um, the ability to, for instance, reproduce, to be independent. Um, and you know, there are a great many criteria that um, he has very usefully listed uh, as you know, demonstrating recovery. Uh, thank you. I wonder if you could ask, um, estimate the mortality rate annually from the various uh, you, um, eating disorders that you've encountered. Um, no, I'm afraid I can't. Um, originally, the same gentleman, Professor Sten Theander, uh, made his name by following up um, a group of patients who were hospitalized back in the 1940s. Um, with uh, very low weight anorexia. In those days, you had to reach a lower BMI than today to qualify. Um, and he found that nearly 20% of those people um, died of causes very closely related to their illness. Um, but that's probably the highest um, quotation that I've seen. What people now generally quote is that if you have anorexia nervosa, your mortality rate is multiplied 10 times the average um, for wherever you live and your, your age. Um, 
we don't actually have any figures at all for what's happening here in Scotland because, as I said in my talk, um, our death certificates aren't able to estimate the contribution made by anorexia to mortality. Um, Katrina, lady in the down here, it's third row, fourth row. As a diabetologist, before I retired, I was very interested in eating disorders because they seem to be particularly common in young girls with diabetes, who of course had an extra way of losing weight by reducing their insulin. But we often wondered if one of the reasons was because they were made to think about food so much, uh, and because initially when they were treated they gained a lot of weight. And I wonder when I see parents with children who are rather obsessed by what the children eat, which is quite common nowadays, whether there's any evidence that making people very conscious of eating and what they eat uh, has anything to do with them developing anorexia nervosa? Well, I think that that's a very good point, but probably the time for saying let's not obsess has passed because um, most people in our society obsess about their body image about what they eat and don't eat, about their levels of activity. Um, and once you say to somebody, stop obsessing, you can even make it worse. I also agree with you that if somebody has a diagnosis of diabetes, they do have to focus on very carefully managing um, what they eat, their intake and their output. Um, and like you, I'm very interested in the, the enormous... Um, epidemic really of weight losing disorders in people with diabetes that illness allows somebody who normally wouldn't be able to tolerate anorexia to lose enormous amount of weights just by neglecting um, just by neglecting their health and unfortunately we don't yet have the answer to that um, a, a lady called Amy Martin did a very good study in Aberdeen looking at um, how many people with diabetes in the young diabetic clinic uh, would actually meet criteria for an obsessional weight losing disorder by emission of insulin. And she found that a huge proportion did. I mean, the majority ticked many, many of the boxes. And interestingly, it was as common in the males as in the females. Thank you. Um, gentleman at the second. Oop. Second in it. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I just want to pick up on your passing comment that you're on your interest in psychotherapy. Uh, and the latter part of your talk perhaps was focusing more on the, the kind of chemical, organic ch treatments and changes taking place. What do you think is the future in, in, for the psychotherapeutic psychothera support for people with eating disorders? And I'm particularly remembering your, was it your hot cross bun from your CBT and the feelings of fear and perhaps anger with the self in the patient. So what's the, what's the interplay with the psychotherapy support uh, as well as perhaps the medical support? What I would like to hope is that some of the um, sort of quite shockingly uh, drastic medical treatments might actually work to allow people to do psychotherapy. I think, you know, everybody has to do either formal or informal psychotherapy as they go through adolescence at whatever age to learn the skills for coping with life and with difficult emotions. I think it would be such a pity if some people simply couldn't do psychotherapy purely because the emotions concerned were totally overwhelming. Uh, so I do think that there is certainly a role um, for continuing to offer psychotherapy, but perhaps... Um, you know, many of my patients simply can't do it because they're in a state of total panic and grip and can't concentrate. Uh, in the back row, the lady in the back, uh, second back row, <laughs> and then Lady Daniel. You talked about the importance of um, greater rather than lesser amounts of support at times of transition. Yet, perhaps the, the greatest time of transition is for, for young people is moving away from home to university, and yet they seem to be left rather high and dry at the moment. What's being done to try and redress that? Thank you. It's, it's a terrible plight. Um, I think one of the things that we should be doing and are trying to start doing um, is looking at graduation from child and adolescent services. 
So whether the person is leaving to go to university, is leaving that service merely because of the boundary of age 18, I think it's very important that people concerned on both sides um, of treatment, so people in adult services or people in the services where the person is going to university, should try to meet up all together uh, so that there is a proper handover. People are developing transition guidelines, and I'm sorry to go back to guidelines all the time, but at least if we have some sort of example of pathways that do work, um, then hopefully uh, we can hold on to people from both sides rather than just one, one um, service discharging them and the other saying, oh, they've got to go to the back of a waiting list. What we do in um, Grampian is that we have regular meetings every couple of months where everybody coming up to the age of 18 is considered. Uh, and if they're coming to adult services, then the adolescent services actually chum them um, to a session with their new therapist rather than just sending them. On the other hand, with um, students who are away during term time, I don't think we've solved that one. I think it would be important to identify which service, whether it's the ones at university or the ones at home, are going to be the lead. Uh, and then we might, I think, use video conferencing uh, to enable people to keep in touch when they're away from their lead service. And there's a, a lady down here in the centre. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I saw a hand up there. Um, well, first a lady in the very back row, and then a gentleman three row, four rows in. Thank you. I'm interested to ask the question, given the increased prevalence of this condition, um, how do you think the eating disorder community is going to cope with the expectation of NHS treatment being deliverable at 18 weeks within the psychiatric setting like it is with other medical conditions? How is that going to be resourced? I think probably that's a question for politicians rather than for me. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that already a lot of my colleagues bust a gut in the NHS. Um, and offer far, far more than they're actually resourced to offer out of passion and goodwill. Um, and also because if you see an illness taking somebody hostage, um, you go over and above. It's not just because of 18-week targets, it's because you can't bear to see somebody suffer. Perspective. Um, but I'm just fearful, is there a risk that people will be discharged from care to allow that 18 week cycle to be maintained, you know, there, there's only so many people who are trained in these areas of expertise. You know, how are you going to ship people in, even if the politicians actually give you additional funding? Well, I think that goes beyond eating disorders. But yes, we're often under a great deal of pressure to discharge people who are no longer in extremis so that people can come in and take up the bed. And I have to work very hard to say we have to finish jobs that we. Um, we have a, a huge responsibility um, to helping people through the next transition um, from one service back to outpatient services or from outpatient services back to their GPs rather than just let go of people because there's somebody even more ill than they are. Uh, Una, this gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Would we say that <coughs> occupational compulsive disorder is a regular precursor of anorexia, <clears throat> and if so, if you think that is a possibility, could more be done by treating the OCD before it perhaps develops into full-blown anorexia, or do you think there's no correlation? Oh, I think there is definitely a correlation, and there's um, a lot of very good work um, showing that there are possibly two different strains, as it were, of anorexia. <laughs> Um, one where the person is very likely to suffer from a whole range of obsessive conditions and the other which is less closely linked to OCD itself um, and perhaps has more to do with the bulimic disorders and the, uh, the depressive disorders rather than the very obsessive disorders. Um, so personally I think that there might well be a great deal to be done uh, by making sure anyone that shows obsessive signs is looked after to make sure that the obsession doesn't take root and cause them to lose weight. Because on top of having an obsessive predisposition, if you once starve the brain, it's very likely that any obsessive tendency gets worse. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you very much for the questions, and thank you very much, Dr. Morris, um, for your talk. Um, I'll go right <coughs> In fact, there are quite a few people to be thanked, not only Katrina and Una, who've been wielding the microphones, <coughs> our performers, um, Sarah, Alice, and Francis, thank you so much. And then, of course, finally, and indeed most importantly, to Dr. Morris. <coughs> The celebrated actor Ellen Terry declared that the prerequisites of a successful career on stage were intelligence, imagination, and industry. Uh, that's as may be, but these qualities are evident in Dr. Morris's career and in her performance this evening, and they certainly show that they make a successful psychiatrist and a consummate lecturer. Her explication of the history, the potentially tragic effects, and the current advances in the treatment of the illness has demonstrated her intellectual clinical excellence, her deep sympathy with the victims, and her indefatigable battle against it. We are told these days a great deal in universities about the impact factor. I think that there is a, an embodiment of the impact factor um, before us. Um, the subtitle of her talk was How we, we, Will We Manage? I think Dr. Morris will play a key role in how we do manage eating disorders in the future. So on your behalf, I would like to thank her very, very much indeed um, for her talk this evening. My final duty is to say that should you wish um, any, um, to come to any more events, forthcoming events here at the Royal Society of Edinburgh, um, you will get information out in the foyer. And um, do speak.